All right, we're going to transition and get some responses, really, to the things that DJ has, has put forth here uh, from four panelists. And uh, they, I could not have put together, and, and congrats to those who did, put together a panel that had uh, the breadth that we have here and the, the variety of experiences. So um, DJ, you know, as a director, he gets to sort of play in this very big sandbox. But then somebody also has to figure out how to finance it, how to sell it, how to copyright it, how to get it into the marketplace. And so here we have uh, folks who might be on more of the quote unquote hidden side of the business. Um, they're, they're working as producers, they're working as financiers, as lawyers, as licensors, as marketers. Um, so I'm just going to go down the line, give a brief <laughs> introduction, and then we'll sort of launch into it. Does that sound all right? You with me? All right. So um, uh, on the end here, Rick Shermer. Uh, I first met when he was marketing one of my films. Thank yes. you, Rick. Yes, sir. You got very, it. Very, very gracious. Right um, when I left Disney, first, first grassroots movie I've ever did. So Yeah. So Rick has ha, yeah, had, had worked in marketing at Disney and then uh, worked with me on a, a, a small film with a big heart um, and has now moved over. I love that movie, by the way. Thank you. You're one of the three I know. who saw <laughs> it, I think. But, but I'll take that. It's called Extreme Days. It's, it's perfect for your 10-year-old. It, it was great. It was great. So um, The blue flame scene, man. Yeah, we don't need to go there. You want my heart. <laughs> he um, and now he's president of, uh, of DBA, which I love the title, DBA Marketing. Um, really involved in advertising 2.0. And uh, so please give a big hand to Rick Sherman. Pepperdine grad, MBA grad. Uh, next to Rick, we have Charles, is it Raggio? Raggio. Raggio. Mm -hmm. Italiano? Yes, yes. All right. So is my wife. It's a good thing. Um, Charles uh, was involved in music management and working for Capitol Records, uh, dealing with content acquisition and music supervising. Um, he, he supervised films by uh, people like Finn Taylor. I saw a couple of his films at, at Sundance that you supervised on, including uh, Cherish, which has the most amazing ha Hall & Oates soundtrack of all time. Um, you've never seen Hall & Oates used as a soundtrack to like a sort of a scary serial killer movie until you've seen what Charles did with it. So. Um, and then now uh, he is working, uh, he worked on Scion and their branding campaign um, and has now been working at Current TV for the last three years, business affairs, programming, ad sales, again, music supervising. And uh, so I think he has a lot to say about this moment that we're in um, and has even been working on a crowdsourcing television project. So please give a big hand to Charles. Welcome. Rachel Kimbrough uh, went to Penn, and then she went to oh, whoa, Pepperdine whoa. Law School. Princeton. Oh, Princeton. Oh, that was wrong. <laughs> All those Ivy Leagues. We get them confused out here on the West Coast. I apologize. <laughs> Tragic. Um, let me start again. Rachel Kimbrough is a uh, Princeton grad, proud Princeton grad, and Pepperdine Law School grad. And uh, she has, is now uh, counsel at Summit, which, uh, you know, if you've seen such small phenomenon as Twilight, uh, you, you have seen the Summit effect, sort of this studio rising to this amazing heights, and including, of course, the six Oscars that were won for The Hurt Locker. So she's been on both sort of the smart film as well as the <coughs> kind of global phenomenon. So please give a big welcome to Rachel Kimbrough. Yeah. <laughs> And Richard Hall, Vanderbilt grad, started as a film producer and uh, worked on such Miramax films uh, as She's All That. Do we remember She's All That coming down the stairs? Oh, yeah, that was a tragic yeah. moment. Um, get Over It, uh, the famous NSYNC film On the Line. Yes, yes, somebody's going to admit they saw it and loved it. Yeah, right there. See, there's one. There's always one. Um, but then has also been an expert in film finance, has been teaching that at UCLA, um, has a, sort of a, an advisory consultant role with, with digital and the changeover thing, has raised private equity for companies, $350 million funds for people like Universal, um, has helped break up Miramax and, and their Disney uh, divorce, um, and has a new book coming out uh, on sort of this new Hollywood moment that we're in called uh, Dancing with Digital Natives. Please big, give a welcome to Richard Hall. All right, panelists. So uh, DJ sort of painted this picture of the global marketplace that we're in, of uh, sort of the bigger, better version of Hollywood. And yet it, there's also this social media thing, which is in a sense smaller than ever. So how big would you say this sea change that we are in is? Is this kind of a tidal wave of, of change that Hollywood maybe hasn't really seen 
uh, at least maybe in our lifetimes? What, 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 what do you see from where you sit? Okay, I, I say, uh, how, way, how about I go first? <laughs> I gotta say, I defer to Rich because he, he is the, uh, this is funny, first grassroots movie I ever worked on. And Rich, I was just telling him as we were sitting over there, he's a good friend of mine for a long time. And um, he's the first person I ever met when I moved to Hollywood, the first person that worked in the business. So he's the one who, who kind of scared me to death. And I was like, eh. <laughs> he had me read a book. Uh, actually, no, he gave me a book on tape called, um, what was that called? That was uh, mm-hmm. Peter Gruber story, the whole. Oh, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. Um, uh, somebody knows this. Yeah. Hit list? No. What was it? No, it was about no. Peter Goober and... Um, it'll, it'll pop, it'll hit pop run. in our head. Is it Hit and Run? I think it's Hit and Run. run. Yeah, yeah. Hit and run. they went into Sony and... Hit and yeah, run. Yeah, 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 yeah. Hit and Run, yeah. That's funny. Most of the, yeah, anyway, sorry. So so how big is this shift that we're in? <laughs> um, wow, okay, so... Um, so, okay, the big shift. I, you know, look, I think it's the biggest shift since, you know, we started using film, quite frankly. I mean, it... Um, I loved hearing DJ talk about his experiences as a creator of film and sort of what technology means to him. And, and only at the end did you sort of mention what technology means to you when you see somebody viewing it on a little you know, iPhone. And there's pros and cons to that. And I'm sort of somebody that sees it from both sides of the table because I've, you know, after 15 or 16 movies as a producer, I sort of understand that, that sort of process of birthing a film. And you really do birth a film. I mean. Films are not made, they are forced into existence here, so you really give a piece of your soul when you put your, you know, one of these things into production. And so, um, but I also see it from the other side, because, um, because in sort of, as Craig mentioned, in the last few years I've worked more on the financial side and some distribution stuff, and, and so I think there's pros and cons to it, you know? Does DJ want to see someone watching his $52 million movie on an iPhone? Probably not. On the other hand, what if that person never had the opportunity to see that movie in the first place and the iPhone on an airplane was the only place they were ever gonna get around to watching it? Well, that's kind of cool. So to me, it sort of grows the overall pie in a way that I don't think we've ever seen, at least surely since I've been in the business, but quite frankly, you know, I think since Hollywood has been in the business. Um, there's an old saying that it's easier, to, um, it's easier to make a movie without film than it is without a phone. And, and I kind of feel like that that that's kind of one of the things we're seeing here. We're seeing kind of a new way of communicating with people. Um, and so, you know, the way people consume entertainment now has totally changed. I mean, it's the reason that, you know, I got involved in writing this book that comes out next month because I see Hollywood changing more than it's ever changed, ever, um, as people watch entertainment on their laptop and watch it on their iPad and on their iPhone. and. Um, and it's neat. I think it's, a, I think it's really cool and exciting. So to answer your question, I mean, I think it's the biggest change in Hollywood in 70 years. Yeah, and just to, to tap into that, too, I, I think that it's probably the biggest change that's, that's happened in, in marketing in 70 years or mm-hmm. 60 years. I mean, it's, you know, it's, the, the, you know, the whole, everybody's fascinated with the whole, you know, Mad Men generation because of the television show. And, and it certainly was a really cool time because of the renaissance in advertising at the time. And, uh, and it was an exciting time at the time, but since then there's never been such a, a massive shift, um, the shift that we've seen over the course of the last 10 years um, that has slowly eroded and changed to the point where it just kind of really hit critical mass in a big way like in the last few mm-hmm. years. Um, and it's, it's really, I mean, I think that in the same way that DJ was talking about just Hollywood shifting on the filmmaking side, um, on the marketing side is totally shifting too. I mean, I remember when I first worked on my first movie campaigns at Disney when I was there, it was like, you know, I mean, the double truck ad. Anybody in the movie business have been around that, that long? Like a double, you guys don't even know what I'm talking about. <laughs> it's, it's like the double truck ad, like, you know, it's like, oh, you know, this producer wants a double truck, he's gonna get a double truck ad, and it's like basically what it means when you open a big newspaper and you've got, you know, like a big huge ad on one side and a big huge ad on the other side, just one big huge ad, it's a double truck. And it like makes people feel great, you know, especially you put it in LA Times, it's the only paper they read and then they, they think all over the country is getting double truck, <laughs> truck ads. It's like that whole thing is like, okay, make sure that we put, um, we know exactly Michael Eisner's path to work. So he sees like billboards everywhere, you know, on his way, cause he's like, well, this is big, you know? So, but, but anyway, yeah, I think, I think overall, and I think the other thing that, that's challenging now too, is not just in the marketing area, but um, which is affecting really all industries. And, and now so much so that what we do, we used to just do movies and now we do all sorts of, we work with clients from, you know, just a, a very big span from publishing clients to, um, you know, fast food restaurants to, you know, all sorts of companies now, but we still do a lot in movies and entertainment. But 
going back to the entertainment thing, um, what does it mean to produce, be a producer now? I mean, you know, the, I don't know if you guys sit around, I'd like watch YouTube shows for fun at night. Um, and I go through and I just see what's trending. And you see people that are like, you know, like the Shaytards. Anybody watch the Shaytards? All right. <laughs> Dude, I mean, seriously, they, they pump out content like crazy. And they have, you know, they have like consistently three million people that watch their show, three million hits and, and several times a week. And, you know, and you watch, um, you know, Equals Three or anything else that you see that trends on YouTube all the time. These people are like working in their basements, kids. They're just like totally getting, you know, viewership that's insane. It's, it's, it's amazing. So the whole idea of what it means to be a producer, I, I remember, um, um, and I'll wrap my rant with this, but like the, um, the guy who was at CBS last year and an old time guy, Conrad Bachman, you guys remember him? Uh, old time actor, he goes, he goes, so son, what's your end game? You wanna be a producer, don't you? And so I was like, well, it's interesting. I was like, that, but I was, and I just kind of challenged his thought, and I was like, yeah, I was like, you know, it's interesting, the whole idea of what it means to be a producer. Certainly no discredit to amazing filmmakers. It's a whole different category, but producing content, um, I was like, you know, we, we did a live webcast, you know, with a, with a um, movie that worked, worked on The Cove, and like we did a live webcast with the, um, um, the director and had him on, and we had 150, you know, I mean, I mean, Huge, huge viewership, 150,000 people just watching live. And it's just like, wow, that was pretty cool. You know, it's like, that was content we produced. That was like, so it's just the whole throwing on, everything's getting thrown on its head right now. Mm -hmm. Rachel, Charles, what do you think? Well, I mean, I think it's changed, um, it's changed the marketing uh, dramatically. Um, we still do the normal ad buys, but Summit being a younger, smaller, more streamlined studio. Um, we focus a lot on social media, and we actually do do platform releases as well. Um, just because we won't, we have to. We don't have the hundreds of millions of dollars uh, to put in each movie. We want to do a leaner budget, and then we want to make sure we have enough P and A um, to promote the movie. But some of our viewers, especially Twilight, aren't reading the New York Times. They maybe care about outdoor billboards, which used to be the biggest thing, but they care about what's being tweeted, they care about what's on the Facebook pages, and they care what kind of apps they can buy, and so our focus has been on reaching that viewership, and the cool part is that it's reaching a lot more people than it's ever has before. Because, I mean, who's not on Facebook? I mean, grandparents are on Facebook, little kids, pets, everyone. So, uh, I mean, and we have our Twilight Facebook page is like the seventh largest page, like, of Facebook. So when we put something out, we post something on the wall, it like hits the world. So, which is scary, maybe. Uh, <laughs> so uh, it's, it's changing how executives are looking at it. I mean, you've got these staunchy executives sitting in a room and they're not talking about putting money on, into billboards, they're talking about you know, tweeting and things like that. So I think it's going to be a really cool transition. Cool. Charles, what do you see from where you're sitting? You know, from a television perspective, I've actually seen it work backwards to most trends. I mean, we could go off on two hours of what it's done to music. But in television, I've seen a five-year-old cable network pull back on exhibiting full lengths of anything that we would produce, whether it's original content or content we acquired because the necessity to keep the relationship with a very scared carrier industry strong. So they're freaking the heck out about tablets. They're, they are legitimately freaking out about cord cutting, no matter what your opinion on it is. So uh, I've, I'm watching a five-year-old cable network pull it all back because the relationship with our carriers is the most important thing. So it, it's interesting to watch our business evolve and then see the reactions to you know, the counter. So. Um, it, it's, it's interesting to see. I, I think it's interesting to sort of hear the different perspectives on, on what's essentially marketing mm -hmm. here because I think that marketing in and of itself is going through kind of the biggest change we've ever seen. Whether you're marketing movies or you're marketing, you know, Coca-Cola. And particularly for people in this room that I think are struggling with, you know, how do I break into this goofy entertainment business? You know, marketing has become a business of entertainment. It used to be a one-way message where you would go and you'd put up billboards and ads and you would sort of preach a, a one-way message about what you were trying to sell. And now it's a two-way thing. And how do you engage somebody in a conversation when you have to keep them entertained? So every marketer has now essentially become an entertainer. Yeah, that's very true. And, and I think that that's really interesting because it opens up a whole new set of possibilities for jobs even, for people that are young and coming out of school and are creative and innovative 
they can go into Hollywood, or they can go into marketing, or they can go into both, because they're kind of the same thing these days. Yeah, it's a really good point. I mean, a lot of people don't, don't realize that, but when you think about, you know, what travels in the world of, of social media is that, you know, and it's, it's really content, and, and whether it's a, a web series, like we produce web series, but we also produce live webcasts, we produce, we're like, what's the content that's gonna move in the community, you know, online that, that's gonna care? And so how do we reach those people, the influencers and the, you know, the amplifiers and all the people that we think are gonna really, so it's like we're thinking constantly about content that we can create that's gonna hit them right here and right here, and they're gonna to wanna to take, that's compelling good, good content that they're gonna be able to take and pass along. And that's really what it is, whether it's, a, whether it's a sentence, or whether it's a web series, or whether it's a 15 second thing that made you laugh, or whatever it is, it really comes down to content, so. But you said the magic word, which is good content. Yeah. Right? Good content, because, yeah. Because, I mean, here's a perfect example. So, I, my, f I, this is totally lame, but my favorite restaurant in LA is California Chicken Cafe. They make those wraps. Boom, it's I'm with awesome. you, dude. No, it's really, it's really great, so and they're good. really I, super I quick. I like four times it's a great. week, dude. It's cheap, it's awesome. Yeah, it's amazing. Um, I was in there the other day, and there was a big thing on the wall, and it said, you know, follow us on Twitter. And I'm thinking to myself, why in the world do I possibly care what California Chicken ha Cafe has to say on Twitter? Like, and that's the dangerous part about it, that you also have to be able to use these new mechanisms to, uh, to convey good content, right? Because I, 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 to me, like, if California Chicken Cafe is saying, you know, tell us what you like about our, th our, our <clears throat> new chicken wrap, or, you know, hey, um, help us build a new menu. And, and I can do that through this sort of two-way mechanism like Twitter. Now I'm kind of intrigued. Mm -hmm. There's a couple things you're hitting on that I think are really important. One, one is that the, well, okay, the word good content. Yeah. Okay, the word good we gotta like qualify because it's you're right, but it's like okay, I think it's really comes down to the word engaging content because, mm -hmm. it, you know, a dude who's like, so I, I mean, I thought one of the best things I saw last week, and I'm from Kentucky. That's where I grew up. Probably got here. Um, I'm sure you guys could tell by my accent. Um, the, the, this guy like went around and he was like digging in the, you know, and digging in a swamp, like a swampy pond and like grabbing turtles with his toes and picking them up and slinging them around. And like, it was just like not even good content at all, but it was funny. It was just really funny. It was like someone <laughs> made it with like their little, their iPhone and some crazy guy with no teeth is just kind of, it was just funny. It was not good content, but it was engaging. It was funny. It was just something that appealed. But I think that the, the whole thought, um, is that social, social media, and that goes back to what Rich was saying about the, um, that was so important about the um, about Twitter. It's it's really about engaging people and using and trying to understand like in your head what what is really going to engage people with something of value, something that's going to really hit them between the eyes. Whatever it is of value, maybe it's the value just to make them laugh. But if you think about engagement, that's really the the key. And it, the problem is is that it still comes down to strategy, and it's not about social is a tactic. All the tool, you, there's a lot of great tools and tactics that you can use. I don't care if it's Foursquare or Twitter or Facebook or a Facebook app or an iPhone app. It's like those are great tactics, but what's the strategy behind it? And so you see a, right now a lot of people just going like, we gotta have a Facebook page, we gotta do that, we gotta, and they're right, they do, they should, but they don't, but most people don't understand the strategy that kind of goes behind that that's gonna engage people and do, and, and do something. So, I, would, maybe, I would argue it's a, both engagement and good storytelling. Right, so you gotta engage them. So I get engaged with, that's tur good. with Turtle yeah, Man. That's great. You know, guy picking up turtles with his toes. Okay, I'm engaged, you got me. <laughs> yeah. But you got me for about a minute and a half. <laughs> it's totally true. So, <laughs> then, so then what are you gonna do with me once you got me? That's, that's actually a good point. Right? Or not? Um, all right, we're gonna get, take questions here in a second. Um, Charles, you, you know, having been in the music business, you saw maybe the downside of the <laughs> digital moment, right? Sure. So I mean, we're, we're sort of talking about possibilities, but there's also, and, and Rachel, I mean, with legal, right, you're always trying to protect your mm -hmm. content, right? Mm -hmm. to, yes. to corral your content. So what are the sort of the dangers, in a sense, of uh, this digital moment? That you've seen. Uh, well, with respect to music, I, the danger has come. At, it's almost passed. Um, <laughs> those that were able to adapt did. Um, you know, it was. Uh, I, I had a, a, a recurring thought as as it's unfolded over, you know, 15 years is the adaptation and evolution versus adoption and discovery. And unfortunately, you know, the content providers and you know, big six back then, big four now weren't able to adapt in time. And I, I, don't, I don't take sides. I believe in the protection of intellectual property. I believe in the right for artists to, to develop holistically, music side, film side. Um, but the device had a big 
you know, the, the device and, and, and the ease of use of device certainly did impact it. Um, uh, touching on something that you said, what it comes down to is marketing. The brands and marketing companies that get it in the music space now are essentially the best part of the record labels and record industry that existed, say, 10 years ago. So you've got marketing company B that takes the time and money to actually engage and develop an artist that labels don't have money to do anymore, put it together with a brand, and they're able to market it socially or otherwise because they are completely in touch with their audience. Brands are the new record label. That's so, um, you know, the digital revolution has made that. The interesting and irony, ironic part is that some of the tried and true artist development, build the art, you know, let it thrive ideas of an old record business model are the things that make these marketing companies and brand engagement around music work. It's the strategy. It's not the, you know, even, it's not the device, it's the strategy. Rachel, what are you trying to well, I protect? Well, mean, you, you might be almost out of the woods. We're just getting into the yeah. woods. <laughs> Um, we spent a good part of two weeks pulling down leaked Breaking Dawn photos that we're not sure. Like, we're filming remotely. We, I guess someone hacked into, you know, I mean, some account somewhere. And we spent two weeks pulling it down and trying to find the source. We're still looking. Uh, I think we're somewhere in Argentina is this where we're at. Um, the real dailies. <laughs> yeah, the dailies. The real dailies. Real dailies, yeah. yeah things sent to Stephanie Meyer. It, I mean, just, yeah. So, it, and, but the... the no so watermarks on dailies, or...? Uh, we, St Stephanie Meyer's name's on them. Uh, you could see them all over the... the way. Oh. It's, it's all over. Like, somebody just hacked into a system and pulled from where people can, can access, like, high-level filmmakers and studio executives. So... We, so we, we always, we fight the wanting to get content out, and, and sometimes we do want to leak photos and stories and things that we think our fans will appreciate and feel like are, are exclusive and special um, pieces of information so that we can like continue telling the story and continue to um, market the film and, and engage. But also, we want to be able to protect our, our IP so that we can um, work on it refine it, and then put it out in a display that makes sense for us, it makes sense for our fans. So, you know, it's constantly a, a, pull, a pulling and tugging and respecting our fans, but also saying, you know, you can't touch that yet. Like, it's not ready. So, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're still trying to figure out, and I think every movie studio is trying to figure out how you bet. It's not just, you know, someone sitting in the theater and filming you know, with a camcorder and, and filming some like third rate movie, like that's not the problem anymore. I mean, those are a dime a dozen. People do want the movie theater experience, they want the popcorn. Um, but the problem is all the other material that's out there. I mean, you can't keep anything secret anymore either. Like, I mean, you're, the actors are out there. You know, there's, there's no babe, babe, babying anything. So, you know, the, it's great and horrible. Summit does have a film out uh, coming out called The Beaver. Starring um, Mel Gibson. Mel Gibson, I've heard of him. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, very, very quiet individual. Yeah. Uh, just keeps to himself. <laughs> 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 yeah, um, we have this movie, The Beaver, that um, Jodie Foster is directing, or has directed it. Um, it's, I personally think, the best movie Summit has ever made. Wow. I, it's better than The Hurt Locker. It's better than, wow. yeah, it's better than Twilight. Uh, I didn't say that, um, but uh, it's it's fantastic, and we worry about marketing it um, because of Mel. Uh, he's done a lot of things, um, but he's he's a fantastic actor, and he's an even more fantastic filmmaker. So, um, but you know, we just got the Roper review, A plus, almost masterpiece. Where. It's going to be in Cannes. Um, we actually premiered it in South by Southwest. It got amazing reviews. So, yeah, we're you know we're, we're you just kind of baby it, and the information flow has been something we've had to manage because, you know, like the minute you're like, great, the movie's out, it could get killed in a second by someone saying, no one go see this, no one support this movie. But it's not about Mel. It's about a lot of filmmakers, and like luckily Jody carries a lot of weight and respect. Um, but uh, you know we're we're excited about it, and we're hoping it it, it uh, 
opens well, but uh, no matter what, it's, it's gonna be a great film for everyone to see. But I think these are some of the pros and cons of sort of the new way people consume entertainment. So for a movie like The Beaver, if I can see that on my computer, I'm probably not gonna go see it in the movie theater, you know? Possibly. If I can see Avatar on my computer, I'm sure as heck going to see it in the movie theater mm -hmm. because I want that 3D experience, yeah, yeah. you know? Mm -hmm. And I want that whole movie theater thing. Mm -hmm. And to me, that's super cool. And so that mm -hmm. just changes, it, you know, there used to be sort of a one size fits all way of marketing mm -hmm. movies and getting mm -hmm. them out there to their audience. And now that's changed. Mm -hmm. So you have to really sort of understand what you have um, and then understand how your audience wants to view that. And then from a studio standpoint, you also have to figure out where the opportunities are there to make money. So if I'm watching Avatar on my computer and I paid for it, and I'm yeah. gonna go see it in the movie theater again in 3D and I'm gonna pay for it again, mm -hmm. that's kind of interesting. That's an opportunity that didn't exist. As I mean, I think it sort of signals, and this is super cool, but I mean, it signals this change that we're going through, which is kind of a shift from a culture of ownership to a culture of access, where we just wanna have access mm -hmm. to stuff all the time, all the time. Mm -hmm. as opposed to you know, owning a physical DVD in your mm -hmm. hand. Um, and I think that that's a really interesting opportunity for studios and for filmmakers. If you can kind of recognize that that's a new thing, you got to kind of figure it out as you go. I think like the tone, you know, if you guys are you know, just listening to this and, and some of you guys are new getting in the industry or, or been, been around for a while, um, you know, it, it's the, the tone of change is very exciting. It's fun. It's really fun. It's like the, if, you, if you were there before I got there sort of at the end, when I was in Disney, it was like, you know, when things were starting to just get on the verge of begin the beginning of change. And, and it was a little boring, you know, like when you get, because I worked in political campaigns in college and they were fun, you know, and then you get to the studio and I was like, ding, 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 ding. And I mean, Disney's the best. I mean, like they're a great and amazing studio, but, but still things are a little, you know, cookie cutter when you work in there, everybody's got their role and everybody does, you know, you know, field publicity and this and that and that, that, that and everybody kind of has the system. But, but now things are just like a little bit more wild and a lot of folks who've been around for a while are like, oh my gosh, our system's threatened, just like the music business. The system is kind of threatened a little bit. The people who are, you know, 50 who've been doing this for a while are like, whoa, okay, what's a Twitter? You know, or whatever. It's just sort of like one of those things. But but for us that have been, you know, on the cutting edge of it. When they say, oh, did you twit that? I think it's funny to call Twitter the Twitter because it was just like I think it's funny, but anyway, so the, the um, the uh, but so so the Twitter, what's the Twitter? But it, but I think it's just a really fun, exciting time if people are, are in the room who are just kind of getting into things, um, you know. And it's it's been a blast working on. It. I mean, back back grassroots campaigns when we first started them, we we were kind of like tearing stuff up and just tearing down walls and doing, and then technology kept on, you know every bit step of the way we're using more and more and more technology and it kept on escalating to the point where pretty much, you know, I mean like what we do now is, is you know, very, very heavy technology driven. But, um, but it's, it's an exciting time. It's a really exciting time. But how cool is that? It's the wild, wild west. It is. You know, I mean, Total. that's really Total. exciting. I mean, studios, you have to recognize studios aren't built to be machines of change and innovation. They're built to kind of protect the old legacy business models, you know, and and so with that also comes opportunity. I mean, we're still looking for our really big success stories. Uh, we're still writing those big success stories in this kind of new way we market movies. And it's what you're talking about. It's like integrating things like Twitter or, you know, tweet. I mean, look, uh, my mother, dingle, dingle, dingle. you're not going to be marketing my mother on Twitter. She still thinks that, you know, tweeting is texting and... You know, and if she likes a piece of content, it's the kiss of death, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> so it's like it was like, but you know, what was interesting. The so you have to sort of, but but it forces you to know your audience, but it also opens up these super cool opportunities. Did, didn't a lot of people of, go ahead? The playing field. Yeah. You know, like people are able to like Summit's able to play ball with like when we opened our doors with Warner Brothers and Paramount and who are, whoever else was was distributing. So it's and it's also giving the indie guy and the person, you know catching turtles with their toes, uh, yeah. giving him a platform. So it's, it's going to be a really interesting. But you know what's fun, too? I mean, like Hold on. I've got to get we gotta okay, a guy go out here with a question. question. Oh. You, go ahead. Actually, I want to, as he's coming up, uh, didn't a lot of people get shot in the Wild West, though? That's the question, right? <laughs> so yes. I don't know. You know? <laughs> Who's the sheriff? That's Talk maybe my question. Filmmaking and technology. Um, I actually have two questions. Uh, the first is taking it one step further as far as innovation on the revenue side and having that cinematic experience in your living room because you have that great home theater and you can invite the neighbors over and you don't want to deal with the parking at the Grove. Um, when are they going to do that pay-per-view movie rather than, uh, you know, like the sporting events that they do? Um, secondly, uh, 
How, does, how do each of you feel about net neutrality? About what? Net neutrality. neutrality. You can go ahead and explain a little bit in case yeah. they don't know. Sorry. Uh, basically, it's um, the big thing right now on the internet as far as like who's in control of the capacity of the bandwidth. Uh, okay, uh. Yeah. It's, um, it's about who's the sheriff, sort of. Got it. Correct. You know? got it. Yeah. Well, I'll go first. I, I think that, uh, you know, I don't need AT&T to control the pathway that I go down to see my content. Mm. Quite frankly, that's a little freaky to me. Um, not surprising that this is happening because we're still looking for the business models that are out there. Um, I'm not sure that the, I'd like to think that AT&T would be so benevolent that they would sort of just keep their nose out of it without the government having to come in and sort of dictate <laughs> it. Nonetheless, turns out that um, that may not be the case. Um, but uh, but I, I, just, I, I don't think they should, they should you know, be able to control, sort of, you know, make me pay because I watch more movies and make me watch the movies they want me to watch. But look, the cable companies and the mobile carriers are, they, they need help. They too, I mean, they're the only business that makes Hollywood look like, you know, a change machine. <laughs> you know, I mean, to put that in perspective, yeah, you know, this is an awesome stat. I just heard this the other day. So on your, you know, on your cable video on demand, um, uh, you know, I, I watch movies on video on demand all the time. Mm -hmm. And so um, movies that start with the letter A, B, C, or D in their title do infinitely better than all the other movies combined <laughs> because on your cable system, you still got to scroll by letter. Oh. Like, really? Are you kidding me? <laughs> Seriously, how can I cannot type something in? So they're struggling. They're struggling because they're boneheads, but they're also struggling because they're trying to keep up with this change and they have these sort of massive machines. So I understand why they would try to do things that you know, make them more money. I just prefer them not to do it with me. Well, <laughs> well and, and also, the, I mean, speaking of the cable uh, networks and, and, uh, and the mobile carriers and the studios, like everyone's worried about like digital dollars and how those translate into their pockets again. So. I went to a, a conference earlier this year and they talked about how everything's shifting and like there's going to be this cloud. And I'm sure some of you already use cyber lockers now where your content just lives in space. Like wherever you're at, whether you're in California or you're in Russia, pull your content down. It's there for you. It's protected, supposedly. Um, Unless you're Twilight Dailies, and it's not. <laughs> uh, but uh, now the studios are getting together, and they're putting together this the product called Ultraviolet. I mean, Summit's not involved with this, but the big studios, and they're working with carriers, and they're going to probably launch this later this year, and it's going to be basically the end-all, be-all. It's going to be like the Roku, you know, to the second, third power. Um, and no matter where you are, like, once you buy your content, whether it's on your iPhone or whether it's on your iPad or or just ordering on a normal cable box it'll be able to sit there in their cloud and you'll and with having that subscription and the whatever box they'll have with it so people are adjusting and and you know the studios do want to close the day and date between I think your first question was when can you get the movie like immediately you know the the theater distributors are still the kingpins they're still the old-fashioned guys who are like old-fashioned New York gangster guys who control that, like a lot of that world. And that's not going to go away anytime soon. And people still do want to go to the theater. But like DJ said, Netflix has a vested interest in throwing a little bit of money out there to some up-and-coming filmmakers because it's, in a, it's a great investment for them to build mm -hmm. their brand as a development tool, excuse me, as a distribution tool. So yeah. that... Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's amazing how people music just, is. Go ahead. Uh, I was just gonna say it's amazing how people want to cling to their business models so bad because it takes so long to create their business models, and so they just are just like, mm, and they'll just hold on to it, you know, as tight as they possibly can to their own to their own demise. I mean, look at Blockbuster. So I mean, it's just like you know, it's like they just they want to fight instead of like actually go for it, and by the time they start to fight, it's too late, you know. That cloud fight in music will be raging by the end of this year. We're gonna get out ahead of you guys the cloud. again <laughs> for a little while, and, and you can. It's not gonna be pretty. Well, I'm curious though, because you know, you're a music business, or you've got roots in the music business, you know, and, and you mentioned ultraviolet, and ultraviolet is. And you guys know the. I mean, did she explain ultraviolet well enough? You, so, you know, um, it's 
ultraviolet is, is Hollywood's answer to the music business. I mean, everybody sat around and they did this, you know, they did 42 research reports about why the music business, you know, uh, isn't working these days. And they all basically determined that it was because the music business made you pay for the same piece of content over and over and over and over, depending on the device that you were watching it on. Yeah, so you'd go, yeah, you know, you'd go buy a CD and it'd have a song on it, and you'd listen to that, and you pay for it once, and then you want to put it on your MP3 play player, and you got to do it again, and then your iPod, you got to do it again. After a while, people are like, dude, I paid for this song three times, I'm just going to rip it off. And so that was sort of the whole premise behind Ultraviolet. And Ultraviolet has pros and cons to it, too. I mean, one of the biggest cons is that it's run by the nerds at the studio rather than the cool kids. <laughs> <laughs> but nonetheless, I'm curious for your thoughts, having been through that sort of curve with the music business, whether you think that this is going to be the type of thing that saves Hollywood. Um, I, I don't because I believe the, I believe that we're all beautifying, we're all, we all want that smooth transition to happen to the point where we're beautifying the nuts and bolts of distributing content between territories. So Spotify can exist and work in Europe, it can't work here. There are streaming radio services that work very well here that can't work overseas. These were beautiful, pure, well-designed, sleek ideas of distributing what people wanted in their new way without paying you know, a replication fee, mm -hmm. if you will, you know, to use the ancient language. Um, so I believe it's, it's full of many, many legal hurdles, not to, uh, to make it really boring, but it's, it's full of, of so many legal hurdles that it's not going to be a, an elegant solution, as, as people think. I mean, we're all going to store it somewhere. There is going to be a model around it that will still have the single purchase and storage. I mean, it's in everybody's interest to build a model that monetizes it. So, mm -hmm. I want to. Uh, our time is drawing nigher. You got a question? Or anything? I do. Hit it, man. Hit it, man. He's hungry. This is a student. He's hungry. He's going to graduate soon. He's got to figure it out. <laughs> so you talked essentially about it's all about marketing, for the most part. Millennials have been marketed with the term downloading. Um, the term downloading has essentially become synonymous with free. And so is the term, or is downloading stealing? And if so, can we train the next generation to believe that? Dude, I just got to say, like, when you came up with your iPad, I was like, a little intimidated. I'm like, that's a big question. <laughs> He's got a big Sorry, question. I write it down. And I was like, whoa. I'm a writer. I wanted to get I'm right, right. Right. I was trying to sweat he was, a little bit. He was downloading something yeah, as yeah, he yeah. was asking <laughs> the question. Actually, it was uh, I am number four, so. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> No, he, he's, I think he'll take those receipts. <laughs> I, you know, well, you ask a lawyer. I mean, downloading it doesn't have to be bad. I mean, we sell our movies online. Um, we do just as big of a push uh, for digital sales as we do with our DVDs and Blu-rays. So downloading, it's about educating the consumer and saying, okay, you know, you have choices out there. There's a million sites. I think if you start entering in like um, WAT, like watch a movie, I think the first thing that comes up is like, it's like you think it might be, or WAT, it's like watch movie and then it immediately gives you illegal downloads. It's not water or anything else. I mean, that's the first thing that comes up. And th what we wanna do is going back to the content and the engaging is get, provide the content for the user in a lot of platforms that's quality. So. You're, instead of buying the movie that's been ripped off in the theater or instead of buying something with like not the best quality for whatever reason, we want to we want to provide the best quality like how we think you're going to want to see it. And that way, I mean, you're willing to pay the extra a couple bucks or pay it all to see it because then you'll have that. So it's about educating, it's about quality and engagement. I think the same, probably the same thing with music. Absolutely, people are making records again. I ran a 360, founded and ran a 360 kind of modeled music company, maybe a little ahead of its time looking back, but we were then making vinyl records and premium pieces of packaging, if you will, not to combat it, but just to give the fans of new original content what they wanted in a way that we could control through, well, one, we could monetize it, and two, we could control it through our, through our distribution network. So um, if you can find cool, creative, engaging ways to deliver the original content the way that the folks want it, I mean, that's the challenge. It's on us. Downloading isn't bad. It, stealing people's property is. Mm -hmm.